Welcome into the fourth mother box. I am your host, Tom Oakry, as always, coming back into Arizona from California last weekend, about for another 70 days or so until we move to Florida. Yes, I am officially putting it out there. I am moving to Florida. My wife and I are moving to Florida to be closer to the most magical place on earth, but more to come on that in the coming weeks. But joining me is all our co-host Kyle Cosentino. And uh, if you guys don't know, Kyle comes to you from a suburb of Chicago, Illinois, where their slogan is, come for the city, stay because you're in the hospital recovering from a gunshot. Kyle, how the hell are you? <laughs> I'm doing good. Excellent. All right. So, yeah, and, and real quick, yes, Courtney and I are moving to Florida. I put that out there. I put it out on social media, and now I'm going to announce it on my podcast that nobody asked for. Um, so that'll be cool. I think, you know, we do talk some theme park stuff, and the closer we'll be to Disney World, we'll know about exclusive shit. I can talk more and show more, Kyle, because you know that we'll be debuting video in exactly one week from today, next week. That's right. We have a YouTube channel. Be on the lookout. You're going to see how ugly Kyle is, and it's it's not a good look, guys. So so just you might want to put some Vaseline on the glasses before you check out our videos, but I digress. Well, you're a ginger, so people are going to have a hard time looking at that. So maybe like a uh, no smoking sticker over your face or something like that. <laughs> Just like the Simpsons when they put a, a drink Duff uh, sticker over Moe's face for the for the Duff calendar. Uh, we yeah. can do a whole podcast on the Simpsons. Oh, my God. I, I never even thought about that. But I'm getting off topic. So Because today's topic is the Wizarding World of Harry Potter. And, Kyle, you actually brought this up as a topic to discuss uh, many moons ago, and um, I'll be bringing on a very special guest later on for the second half of the show once we're done with news and rumors, and that's my loving wife, Courtney Oakery. She will be joining us because she has forgotten more about Harry Potter than I will ever know. So this is a big learning experience for me, and I know a little bit. But, all right, Harry Potter to come, but let's kick it off with some news, and boy, oh boy, was there some big DC news this week, Kyle. Uh, two, and now I, I'd like to rank two, I think are equal in how big the news was with, um, so the news of the week that got me originally that possibly restored my faith in the Snyder in restoring the Snyder verse. That is, is AT&T, the parent company of Warner media is spinning off. And I say that in quotes and merging it with discovery. So you may know Discovery, they own TLC and the Discovery Channel and all that nature bullshit. Um, for, so to form a new media-focused company capable of competing with the mouse and Disney and like the likes of NBC Universal and Netflix. Now, excuse me while I restore the Snyderverse. Uh, Kyle, I'm a little optimistic that we actually might get to see the Snyderverse um, out of, because I did hear that the Discovery CEO is taking over. So that means Warner Media's guys the ones that were racist to Ray Fisher and the ones who pushed them aside, they're stepping aside and there's a new guard. I don't know how you feel, but I'm very optimistic that things might be restored. Well, I, I feel like a changeup is in order over there because like I, we've been talking about in the past couple of weeks, that they just, they fuck up a lot with the DC Universe. They didn't fuck up Harry Potter, but they, they kind of like really dropped the ball in some respects on the, on the DC Universe. So... I'm very much for restoring the Snyder verse. Yeah, and w there's a light at the end of the tunnel. At, le at least I think there was. You know, they said they'd never released the Snyder cut, and we got that four-hour masterpiece in in March. Uh, so we'll see. But moving along, speaking of the good stuff that's coming out of Warner Media and HBO Max specifically, and big props to HBO Max. And there's a lot, a lot of news, a lot of news that you and I gushed about this week. Uh, so Batman animated series. Batman Caped, 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 Caped Crusader is coming to HBO Max, um, a new uh, Batman animated series with um, Bruce Timm on the helm alongside J.J. Abrams and Matt Reeves, obviously famous for the Batman trilogy that will be debuting um, next year. So more Batman, more better, Kyle. What do you think about new Batman animated series? You know, there hasn't been a Batman the Animated Series since, I think, the Batman um, in uh, 2005. So we're about due. And if this is anything like the old school Batman the Animated Series from the 90s, you know, that we all grew up with and that changed all of our lives. I mean, oh, yeah. this is 
I, I think this is going to be great. And I don't know if Kevin Conroy or Mark Hamill is going to reprise their roles, but um, that that needs to happen. Please do. This is this is a plea to whoever you know the the three amigos who are in charge of that show. Get you got to get Conroy and Hamill. Um, but uh, you, real quick, you, I think you mentioned the Batman in two thousand five. Wasn't there something called? Uh, wasn't there Beware the Bat after that? Oh too? yeah, that, that's that's true. It was uh, very short lived. They only oh. like. Remember we watched that and there was like they came out with two episodes and then they just like didn't release the rest of the season until like much much later. And Weird. it was actually it was actually a good show. The animation was a bit different, but you know it was actually a good show. I, I definitely would have um, loved to have seen more uh, more seasons of that of that show. Me too. Maybe maybe they could revive that or I think it's on HBO Max. I, I've seen it somewhere it out there. It is because yeah. that's where I watched. I finally got to watch the rest of it. Uh, so, all right. So, more animated series in the DC universe coming to HBO Max. The Adventures of Superman animated series, following a Gug Clark Kent Superman um, as he's kind of getting to know Lois Lane and Jimmy Olsen, and and kind of like a young super. Oh, not kind of because it's exactly what I said. A young Superman who's figuring himself out. So, I recall a Superman animated series back in the day, similar to the Batman. Um, of course we had the justice league animated series, but this is cool because we've, we've seen in the comics, we've seen a young Clark Kent in the comics, but it's, we haven't seen too much of this in an animated universe and actually explore a younger Clark Kent. I'm talking like a young one working in, in the daily planet, realizing his powers, probably facing some newer threats that he's not used to. So this should be interesting. And, DC does animation right, so I'm very much looking forward to this. Maybe it's going to be like an animated Smallville. Oh, that would be awesome. I'd watch it. But you know what's also really awesome is the DC animated movie that they announced that they are working on next. And if you are a listener to this podcast, you'll know how much myself and especially Kyle love the Injustice storyline and Boy, oh boy, it's finally coming to an animated movie. So, Kyle, I'll kind of let you take off here. I'm sure you're thrilled. You know, I was always wondering over the years whether they would do that. And I kind of figured that they wouldn't because they had the video game and then the long um, comic book. I don't know if the comic book is actually still going on, but I know I read all the first season and it was just brilliant. It was like so much um I mean, I like the video game, don't get me wrong, but the, the comic really expanded upon everything and how Superman kind of took over, and it just was amazing. And, like, in one part, uh, I, I, one of my favorite parts is the par- they find the parasite just, like, causing mayhem in Metropolis, and Superman yeah. just shows up, and he just doesn't give a fuck anymore. So he just rips them in half, and he fucking throws them into space. It was awesome. <laughs> So that's just one of the greatest, um, one great scene in that comic book series. So I think an Injustice animated movie, man, I, I don't even know. I think that's going to be something else. I the hope potential, they, they do really well. Potential is huge. I hope Conroy voices Batman. I still don't know who my favorite Superman voice actor is. It's not the guy from CSI. I, 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 I don't like, I can't, I can't recall his name. Um, Tim Daly and George Newbern are, are two of the um, most com- recurring Superman, and I, I like them both pretty equally. I think they both do a really good job. Okay. They I sound like them. they sound like Superman to me. Okay. This good. is like the this is like the OG actors from Justice League the animated uh, series or Justice League Unlimited. Good. Let's get them. Let's get them going. So the last bit of HBO Max news for DC. Yes, it continues is Batgirl is finally getting her own movie exclusively for HBO Max. The Bad Boys directors will be taking the helm um, of the Batgirl movie, and thank God it's not Joss Whedon, as it was supposed to be originally, but we all would have been so screwed if it was him. So Batgirl, uh, you and I talked about this briefly uh, a few mornings ago. We talked, could it possibly be The Killing Joke? That is her one of her more popular storylines. And for those of you who are unaware, spoiler alert, in The Killing Joke, uh, the Joker goes full-on Joker and paralyzes uh, Barbara Gordon, Batgirl, shooting her directly into the spine. And depending on the iteration that you see, uh, it gets really fucking creepy. Um, and Jim Gordon goes through some shit in The Killing Joke. And I'll just leave it at that because I don't want to get too graphic. 
I don't think they're going to do that right away. I can see if they make a trilogy of her movies, maybe that might be the last one. But I can see them distance, distancing themselves from like Batman and kind of like maybe the extended Bat family. Maybe not. But I, I just think that the spotlight definitely won't be on Batman. Maybe they'll really try to develop her character, kind of, you know, help us understand maybe some of the things that we never really knew about Batgirl, if you, especially if you haven't read the comics, like um, just her ability with being able to like be, you know, like hack virtually anything or be kind of like this computer genius that she is. So right. I, I think it might be it might be an interesting movie. She's super techie, uh, especially when she's Oracle, um, when she's paralyzed and can't help Bruce and batman and the bat family anymore so yeah i'm i'm totally excited for it uh but i'm telling you right now and i'm warning you wb dc whoever's in charge of casting the actress for batgirl if you don't make her a redhead i will fucking find you okay <laughs> if you cast somebody else and they're not a ginger just like batgirl should be i will find you seems like they replace uh every ginger when they have a ginger role they get replaced what is what is it about that is this a conspiracy conspiracy and i don't like it it's a government conspiracy and i intend to look more into it and look out for my newsletter or to come well just so you know and like it didn't happen in harry potter because there was quite the ginger presence damn right the weasleys those are my boys and, and you should know you started as Ginny weasley in all eight films right what was it like to kiss daniel radcliffe i don't know what it's like to kiss daniel radcliffe but i know what it's like to kiss your mother so let's move on <laughs> J Speaking of J.J. Abrams, he will not be directing any DC properties, um, which most are going to celebrate because they hate what he did to Star Wars. I don't. I particularly like what he did with Star Wars. However, his production studio, Bad Robot, will produce the rebooted Superman film franchise. So we, we talked about this a couple of podcasts ago, how they're doing a period piece with uh, Black uh, Cal L. And um, Ta no, I'm going to screw the name up, but uh, they do have a writer at the helm, Ta Nahisi. And they are on a search for a black director to helm the film about a black Clark Kent. And reports state that this won't be part of the DCEU. So not part of the DC Extended Universe. So the movie will stand alone on its own. And it still interests me because it's Superman. Um, but uh, interesting that J.J. Abrams isn't part of it. Obviously, if they're going to focus on a black Cal L, they're going to... It's just makes perfect sense from a standpoint to get a black director for that. So I, I, don't, I don't know how J.J. Abrams even got involved in any of those rumors, but they came out and completely confirmed that this week. Yeah, that would be interesting, to say the least. I like how DC kind of is deviating from the Marvel formula a little bit in that they have their like main storyline if they're still doing the DCEU. And then they just kind of have these uh, like standalone films that they're going to start doing. So I, I like that idea because it kind of, you know, gives you different, maybe can give you a different perspective. I mean, especially like the Joker that we saw. Um, so I think it'll be interesting to see. They're taking they, some risks. Seems like they are, they're, they're taking risks. It'll be interesting. And if it's if it's an Elseworlds movie like the Joker was, then it's it's it, it should be it should be pretty good. So moving along, especially talking about things that Marvel doesn't do, uh, Zack Snyder detailed what role. And this is the last bit of DC news. So what role? So we know John Stewart's Green Lantern was intended to be in Justice League. So Snyder revealed uh, to Uproxx. Uh, and he said, so basically what was going to happen is he, John Stewart, Green Lantern, had two roles. One, we would see him in the post-apocalyptic world. He was kind of like their scout and kind of like their, you know, join the team guy. And then in the final battle against Darkseid, Green Lantern would have gotten the Green Lantern Corps together and organized them to fight against Darkseid. That would have been his two jobs. So, again, we don't have this version of the Justice League 2 and 3 yet. We have the first part of the Snyder Cut, which was Green Lanternless. Um, we were robbed there. We're being robbed of a great follow-up story. So... With that optimism that we spoke about earlier, I hope we get to see this vision on its way through. And John Stewart be vindicated, too. Um, I, I, I'm not going to go to the CW in the Arrowverse to see my John Stewart Green Lantern because I hate the CW-verse. Um, especially it's, it's, with your half-assed attempt at Impulse or, earlier today. But uh, oh I can get that. Uh, let me say this about the Snyderverse and, and the continuation of the Justice League, I wouldn't put that one to bed just yet because I feel like even when I read comments online and people are visceral, and if you ever read like a, a comment under an article 
uh, especially under something like nerd related, people are just vicious. But I swear, like 90% of the comments that I read about Zack Snyder's Justice League are overwhelmingly positive. And I yeah. feel like when the studio execs see that money is going to be made, they'll, they'll green light that film. I firmly believe it. They well, better. Some, uh, they better is right. You make some solid points and only time will tell. But moving along, we've got a little bit of Marvel news, not a ton. Um, Ant-Man and the Wasp, Quantum Mania, basically started their prep for filming. You know, I'm not too sure what's next for Ant-Man and the Wasp. Uh, are you excited to see it? I kind of feel like Ant-Man always gets lost in the shuffle of the Avengers, especially on his, more so on his standalone flicks. I, I like Paul Rudd. I feel like that was such an excellent casting. And I wasn't as into Ant-Man at first, and I think if they cast somebody else, I wouldn't be as interested in him. But um, he's just funny. Like I love Paul Rudd, and I'm even if it, I think his films are kind of designed to be kind of more fun and just not really like you know um, maybe like like go deep or something like that, like a deep, well written story or anything like it. But you know, it's kind of an interesting take. So I'm always looking forward to it. Plus, they have Michelle Pfeiffer and. You know, Michelle Pfeiffer is is just uh, will always be Catwoman to me. So I, I'm always happy to see her in anything. Well, I'll keep it in the Avenger verse. Uh, Anthony Mackie said he didn't think Marvel would work as, or I'm sorry, he didn't think Marvel in general would work as a TV series. You know, like the uh, Falcon and the Winter Soldier. And he told Variety um, that at first, you know, at first he's like he basically didn't think that Falcon and the Winter Soldier would work on TV, and he thought it would be better off in the movies and would play better to audiences that way. Um, and I want to give credit where credit is due at the moment to Marvel. Um, I know a lot of people, you know, crap on us for maybe shitting on Marvel too much, and <laughs> we give it the, their due. And we are DC fanboys. I've made that clear. I mean, look at the fucking name of our podcast for God's sake. Um, but again, I want to give credit where credit is due at the moment and say Marvel has done a really rather you know, good job lately building their TC universe or their TV universe. See, I'm even thinking about DC, their TV universe and building hype for Wanda vision and Falcon and the winter winter soldier. You know, I had my issues with the show separately for, but for the most part, I've enjoyed tuning in weekly. I have too. And I kind of thought the same as Anthony Mackey, you know, I kind of wasn't knowing what I would expect. Uh, when I thought about, you know, watching WandaVision or, or Falcon and Winter Soldier, but, you know, they did a really good job. It's kind of like they they made it the same. It felt like they had the same budget and the same quality as, as the movies. And so, you know, when they did WandaVision and then Falcon and Winter Soldier, these were really well done. And it's made me excited for the rest of it. And they got so many they have so many TV shows coming out for Marvel. I can't even keep, keep track of it all. And uh, I think it's going to be really exciting for a really exciting time to be on uh, TV. And Disney Plus is just fucking nailing it out of the park. They got Star Wars and Marvel TV shows. Like, we're never going to leave our houses. And no. There's going to be no reason to. No. I mean, what. <laughs> When we move to Florida, I'm just going to have to build like a tube that goes from our place right to Disney so I could just go from what's on Disney Plus and into the parks back and forth. That's mm -hmm. essentially what he wants to do, and I should just sign my paycheck right over to them every week. Just move into the castle in the Magic Kingdom. Like, it's it's fine. You just do that. I will. Have, or you could just zip line or something. You know how they have like the zip line from the castle? I do. Use that. Yeah, you can use that somehow. I will. I will. Maybe I'll call my buddy the Duke in Resident Evil Village and and get get me to hook a get him to hook us up if he's not dead by a heart attack already. Uh, yeah, he's he's got cluster beaties for sure. <laughs> uh, speaking of gingers, Kirsten Dunst might be back in Spider Man No Way Home. So yet again, another casting of somebody who might be in this movie. Uh, as we all know, everybody and their mother is in Spider Man No Way Home, and I'm not even joking. Um, there was a weird tweet and an IMDb credit to someone in Kristen's or Kirsten's inner circle. And the rumor sparked that she's in the movie too, again, alongside everybody. Uh, so do you, do you want to see this version of Mary Jane back in Spider-Man No Way Home since they're kind of going with a multiverse approach here? I've been saying this for years. If they can do a multiverse where they bring back Tobey Maguire and Andrew Garfield, any of those characters, like, that would be... And, and they've even kind of... They've even talked about this. They've... 
they've said Tom Holland said himself, like this is the most ambitious standalone superhero movie of all time. And I well, I believe it. I believe it'll happen. Like because it just it will break the internet. It, and I, I think fans really want to see this, especially if they can keep it contained where it's not like you know overly done. You know what I mean? Um, I hope. So. I, I would love to see it. I know it's going to be good, and I know it's just going to be the next level. So I can't wait. I cannot wait either. So moving it along to Star Wars and some Disney Parks news merged together. Kevin Feige, you know, the Marvel, the the mind behind all the good stuff with Marvel, said he has no interest or ambition on taking the helm of Lucasfilm. Thank God is all I could say. Yeah. I do not Marvel like Star Wars films. And there's no knock on Kevin, Kevin Feige. He's done a really good job with his universe and his style. It's worked excellently. But I don't want that in Star Wars. Yeah, you know, I think uh, Kevin Foggy's vision works really well with Marvel. Star Wars just kind of seems like it's a different, uh, it's just a different entity all in itself. I mean, it's got similar features, just kind of with, with the brand, that humor that they use, you know, every once in a while in Star Wars. But I don't know. I think Kevin Feige should focus on Marvel. And like two two franchises is like too much. Two big franchises is just too much. So I'd assume he'd give up the Marvel post. But yeah, two big franchises is a lot. It's like Theo Epstein going from the Red Sox to the Cubs and winning two World Series. <sighs> Excuse me. But anyway, all right. He's staying in the galaxy far, far away. Galaxy's Edge. Doc Ondors, uh, the uh, purveyor and the keeper of all things legacy lightsabers over at Anbatu and Black Spire Outpost. Dropped the Darksaber this week. The infamous Clone Wars and Rebels um, dark saber that's wielded by the true leader of Mandalore. You know, we've seen Darth Maul wield this. We saw it very heavily featured in the Mandalorian. Its current owner is, well, that we know of right now is Din Djarin, the Mandalorian. Um, but, uh, Kyle, I told you, um, thanks to my buddy Brad at Magical Merch, I'm um, getting the, the dark saber shipped to me. I could, I just could not wait until I got to Florida to get this, get my hands on this. It's, it's one of the most badass sabers of all time. And I feel like everybody needs to have one, especially you. So I'm glad that you're getting one. Thank you. Thank you. I will, I will definitely share on our next podcast as soon as it arrives. But anywho, uh, moving along, some, a few more. Um, Rise of the Resistance, uh, and, and this is a sign for theme parks. Uh, we're getting back to normal people. Rise of the Resistance is removing their plexiglass and social distancing guidelines. We're close. You know, they removed the outdoor mask mandate. Um, social distancing is a thing of the past necessarily outside. You can eat and drink while walking again <laughs> at, at theme oh, parks. Oh, thank God. I didn't know that. That's, that's great. That's like the worst. Like, it was, how great is that to walk and drink at something, you know? Little, little liberties, I guess. And they're not really liberties, but, but li- li- like little things we didn't know we missed. But good signs, good signs. That, you good know. signs. So, um, and last bit of Disney news, Disneyland Paris is reopening June 17th. So more theme park openings, um, the better. And I, this is probably the one park that I want to go to as soon as we start traveling to the foreign parks, mainly for the castle and the dragon that's underneath the castle. Um, and guys, there's a rumor of Port Orleans reopening on August 1st. So that means beignets for all. Wow. Do you think uh, the Duke will be there from Resident Evil Village? He's probably waiting outside right now. Yeah, he probably is. That's probably how he got that way. He just, he just, he found out about beignets at the Port Orleans, and he just decided that that was what he was going to eat for the rest of his life. He's going to be on my six hundred pound life, like I think the next season, and he's probably going to be their biggest. I almost said contestant, but he's going to be their biggest patient. <laughs> it's like a contestant. Who, who's the biggest? <laughs> yeah, the Duke. Oh, that'd be funny. He'd win hands down. But uh, speaking of things going down and hands down, um, it's time for this ginger to snap real quick before we talk about Harry Potter. And I have one more thing to say. And I changed my topic uh, outside of the show notes that I sent you guys. But I have one more thing to say about The Last Jedi. Okay, can we just talk about The Last Jedi? Oh, go fuck yourself. I still have a hard time with the people who don't consider this movie canon. Like, okay, Chad, because... Everybody who hates this movie is named Chad. But okay, Chad, we get it. You didn't like the movie with real character development and a movie that gave us porgs. 
there it is, Chad. You hate porgs. And your daughter that you somehow managed to have in high school at Freda Felcher loves porgs. So essentially, Chad, your daughter doesn't love you anymore. I mean, what gives? Why spend all your time bashing The Last Jedi and ripping on Disney every other misspelled world, word online, you demented keyboard warrior? How would you have made that movie? Wait, wait, let me guess, let me guess. The movie starts and we see Luke, and Luke sees Rey with, with the saber. He takes it and then he yeets her off the cliff. And that kills Rey. Rey's dead, all right? He, there you go, Chad. You, you killed the Mary Sue. You killed Rey. Because, Chad, we all know you're a misogynist and can't handle women being stronger than your favorite Jedi who was into his sister once. So then after that, Luke channels super Jedi powers and can fly. And, and you know, Jedis can fly now, apparently, according to Chad. And he flies all the way to Kylo Ren, who <gasps> turned out to be Darth Vader resurrected because you're such a smart movie writer, Chad. But, like, the twist is Dark, Darth tells him, Luke, I am your grandfather, too. And everyone in the audience is like, oh, shit, this is Empire Strikes Back again. And then they leave, Chad, because that movie would be really fucking stupid. And the stupidest bunch of horse manure that anyone could have ever seen. Look, The Last Jedi is really good. And I can respect people who don't like the movie, but don't shit on it for reasons you don't understand. It's my favorite Star Wars movie. Luke having to learn from failure is such a rich story. And I'm not sorry you hated it, Chad. You're just mad because the internet told you to be. Suck it. All right, you ready to talk about The Wizarding World, Kyle? Yeah, yeah. I was just going to say, you really don't like that uh, Chad guy. No, no Chad, Chad is pissing me off, and, and if I ever see him on the streets... Oh boy, oh boy. So let me let me reintroduce. I actually introduced fully my wife, Courtney Oakry, who's joining us. And she's joining us because, you know, my favorite band is Metallica. My my right arm is full of Metallica tattoos. And, you know, my Metallica, my DC Comics, my Star Wars is her Harry Potter. So her tattoo on your left arm is a half sleeve of Harry Potter tattoos that hopefully will be filled up more uh, down the line. But how you doing? Great. Thanks for having me. You really had no choice. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So with Star Wars, uh, Star Wars, with Harry Potter, geez, my mind's on the last Hello. Jedi. So, so shut up. You're going to go last now, Kyle. <laughs> so, um, being the Harry Potter guru of all of us, how, how did, you know, and, and this question goes to all of us, but Courtney, you start first. Uh, how did we all get into Harry Potter? Was it the books first? Was it the movies first? And, and why was Harry Potter such a hit? So for me, um, I definitely got into the books first. I was a bookworm growing up, loved books. And um, I still remember it was the Scholastic Book Fair in the fifth grade. I was 10 years old and walking around, looking at all the books, probably my favorite day of the year, second to Christmas. And my friend Casey said, hey, look at this book. It seems pretty cool. And I'm like, you know what? I'm going to go for this one and dove headfirst into it. I think I read the entire thing all night didn't sleep, loved it, um, basically wore the cover off of it. It was my favorite book. Couldn't wait for the second one. And I think too, um, I really got into it because I was the same age as the kids in the book as well. So I think that kind of helped that I grew up with the books as well. This was the Sorcerer's Stone? Yeah. Okay. Which is, I learned, thanks to you, called the Philosopher's Stone in England. Yes. Oh man, look at me. I'm learning stuff. <laughs> All right, Kyle. Kyle, how about you? I know you're you're, you're bigger than Harry Potter out, out of the two of us. So, how did you really get into it? So, Harry Potter to me is like what Star Wars is to you. Okay. And uh, you know, I actually, when Harry Potter first came out, I actually didn't like it. Like, I I don't know. I think it was just like I saw that everybody else liked it, so you do that kind of like thing where like, oh, well, other people like it, so I don't like it. And then one day, I was just um, there was nothing on TV, and I noticed that the uh, Sorcerer's Stone was on TV. So I'm like, all right, I'll, I'll give it a watch. And like, I like, I, I got hooked into it like right away. And at that time, Chamber of Secrets was actually in the in the theater. And my neighbor, he was really into Harry Potter, so he was kind of talking to me more about it. And I went to see Chamber of Secrets right after that, and I was hooked ever since. And then I read all the books. And uh, man, I could watch those movies a million times, and they would never get old to me. So, you didn't mention that Ryan looks like Harry Potter too. <laughs> you have he, to mention. He used to look like him. He doesn't look like Harry Potter anymore. Just, Not anymore, no. But but back then, he definitely looked like Daniel Radcliffe. Hundred percent. Yeah, he kind of did. He kind of did with the glasses and everything for sure. <laughs> Awesome. Yeah. And, and for me, and it's, it's funny and, and I'll just make mention of this. 
I, to be honest, I only ever saw the first movie in theaters with my dad and stepmom and my sister at the time. What that was 2001. When Sorcerer's Stone came out? Does that sound right? Yep. Yes. Yeah. 2001. And I remember enjoying it, but for whatever reason, the fandom just didn't catch me. And maybe it'd be different if I had the books at my, you know, ready. And my dad and stepmom took us to the movie because it was the hot thing at the time. It was like, oh, Harry Potter. And there was so much noise behind it, just like you mentioned, Kyle. And that's why they took us. Um, But you know, really, and that, that was it. That was the end of Harry Potter for me. I, I, I never saw much more. I never read anything more. But fast forward to my relationship with Courtney and then bam. And then, you know, I'm trying every day to become more and more, you know, into the knowledge of all things Harry Potter, not just for her, but because now that I actually sat down and took the time, especially because of the interest that she had, you know, holy crap, this is a this is an awesome universe um, The they offer so much. It's 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 interesting. It's you know different from the Star Wars lore. It's different from the DC stuff, um, and, the, and there's something for everybody in there. And I like stories where things are connected. And you know I love the Snape, you know, you know the the role that he plays in the movies. So um, I did, I haven't read any of the books unfortunately, but I will one day. I will one day um, because my wife over here has every single one of them on her bookshelf. So all right. Let's let's move it on to one of my favorite parts of the series, uh, the the movies at least, and I'm sure I'd love them in the book too. But Lord Voldemort, um, aka Tom Riddle. Um, so, guys, to my understanding, and I want to hear your thoughts on Voldemort in general. But to my understanding, Tom's a half blood. Um, he was treated terribly by his parents, or one parent who was a Muggle and never received that proper love that he s- just has vengeance against right now is one of the reasons why he doesn't like Harry or hates Harry. Um, he was abandoned by his father in the streets of London and Tom grew essentially to hate half bloods and muggles as one would if, if you're, you know, been abandoned. And, uh, I'm going to need to hear more about his daughter, Delphine, a little bit, uh, who was in the cursed child, but, but, um, cause she, her, her role kind of intrigues me, but, uh, Courtney Voldemort talk about he who shall not be named. Yeah. So I really like him as a villain and I really like the backstory with him. And it really makes you understand why he may be the way that he is as evil as he is. Professor Umbridge, on the other hand, she's just a nasty bitch. She has no explanation. She's just terrible. I think in my head, as much as everybody hates Voldemort and all the people that he killed and he has a demented mind, I you can almost understand why he is the way that he is. He doesn't understand love. He was never loved. And in a way, you almost see that he's jealous of Harry because love protected Harry. He couldn't kill him. Um, so it almost makes sense. Professor Umbridge is just a nasty bitch. So in my head, she's the true villain. She is a villain. That's for sure. God, um, yes. Yeah. Typically, villains don't get me that pissed off, but Umbridge just gets under my skin. It's it's the one thing about book five and even the movie that uh, the um, what's her name who played Umbridge? She did it masterfully because I just hated the shit out of her the entire <laughs> movie. <laughs> but yeah, you're absolutely right. She actually got hated on in real life because she played that role so well that fans kind of hated her. And in real life, of course, she's a sweet lady she's not professor umbridge but she said it was almost harrowing how people were acting towards her after order of the phoenix came out because she played that role so well amelda staunton i believe her name is but i i believe it i think king joffrey the kid who played king joffrey had the same experience in game of thrones if you guys don't know game of thrones no no it's it's i'd have to catch up on game of thrones which which i could but but I'm not going to do that. We're talking Harry Potter right now, damn it. So, Kyle, talk about Lord Voldemort. Um, where do you think he ranks on, like, the all-time villains list? So, for me, like, I was thinking about this. He would definitely be number two. And, obviously, the Joker would be number one. And I, and I maybe should have mentioned this. I'm going to throw a little hate on Marvel again. But, like, anytime the joke, there's, like, a Joker in the movie, they win an Oscar. And it's, like, well-deserved. And you can't see, nobody from Marvel is going to do that. I'm, I'm going to just lay it down here. Nobody from Marvel can do that. And uh, that's what I'll say about that. But back to Lord Voldemort is that I think what makes a great villain is somebody that you're afraid of. And, it, you know, J.K. Rowling did, created him masterfully. He was so well written. He was so unique. I mean, I think, uh, you know, especially in the movies, too, is like, Ralph Fiennes in um, 
his relationship with Harry and, and just, you know, kind of like, he, he's kind of like the, like in the background almost. And you can almost, he's not even in the movies a lot, but you can feel his presence. And I think that's, what's really great about him. I was just thinking that when we were watching movie number five um, was just because he had this grand entrance in uh, the Goblet of Fire when he finally essentially reveals himself to Harry. And then he's not seen too much in the next flick. And but but you're right. There's that presence. There's that, you know, Voldemort's around the corner at any moment. You just feel it. You see the dark mark. You see his his followers emerging. Um, So, yeah, ranking him number two is I think he's he's, he deserves it he'd be ranked number three for me at all-time villains that go Joker Darth Vader then Voldemort um for me but but uh, I don't know that's just my thought and I think just the fear that everybody has of him and like you don't even see him do a lot of evil you know in the in the beginning you just hear people talk about him and so and maybe we're going to talk about this but you know HBO Max is there's been rumblings of like you know, that there's going to be an HBO Max TV series of Harry Potter. And I always thought it'd be good to see, like, the Order of the Phoenix when they first came around, when Voldemort fo- first rose to power, because they think that's a story that we all want to see. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And, yeah, we, we are going to talk about that a little bit. I'd, I'd be curious to see what, what you guys want to see on HBO Max moving forward. But Voldemort's up there with with you know, those, those top villains for a reason. J.K. Rowling did a great job writing Voldemort and uh, he played almost perfectly on screen. So, along some other things in the flip side of, of, the, of the, you know, good and bad, uh, but uh, the love interests, right? So, Ron and, Her- Ron and Hermione are supernatural together. Um, and this is, this is my view on, on things, and, and I want to get your guys' thoughts. And, and it works. Ron and Hermione work. But Harry and Ginny ultimately end up together. And I feel this way with every woman that Harry's interacted with in the movies, except for Luna Lovegood. I don't know why that seemed to work. Um, and I want to definitely get Courtney's thoughts on that one. But Harry and Ginny just felt rushed. Um, kind of just because? Is it because the book had them, had them end up together? Did Ginny have more personality other than a wet carpet sample uh, that she portrayed in the movies? Um, I assume it's more naturally. So, Court. Yeah, so I think this is one of the biggest things for me. I think overall, the movies were a great representation of the books. They didn't really cut a lot out, but what they did cut out is the um, relationship that Harry and Ginny had from the very beginning. Ginny was sassy. She was funny in the book. She had a great personality. There was a lot of flirting and looking each other and catching glimpses and it was throughout the entire books and you were kind of rooting for Harry to be with Ginny. They kind of formed a friendship when they started uh, Dumbledore's army and you were just kind of hoping for more throughout the entire book. He does date Cho Chang there for a little bit and it's like the whole time in the book you're like why Ginny is right there and Ginny kind of dates a little bit too and the whole time you're just kind of rooting for them so when they end up together in the end it's like thank you finally geez kind of like a little bit with Ron and Hermione you see that relationship a lot more in the movies and it is like that in the books but they really miss out on that relationship between Harry and Ginny and I wish we could have seen that in the movies but knowing you have to cut some things out it's just unfortunate fortunate was there tension like there was especially in the movie we just kind of watched the, the other day uh movie five uh order, order of phoenix. phoenix yeah yeah order of phoenix and that's when luna's introduced right and it just feels like there's a little bit of not sexual tension i mean they're kids but it feels like there's like a love interest tension in there is that done purposefully or was that just a director's vision like is it like that way in the books too between Ron and Hermione? No, no, no. Between Luna, I'm sorry if I whipped the microphone and people listening to that. Uh, Luna and Harry, like that that 10 minutes that they kind of spend together outside, towards the end of the movie, outside the room of requirement. She's just standing there and they're talking to each other. I think that's when she finds her shoes hung up. Yeah, I, I don't think that it's necessarily like flirting or anything. I think it's just introducing how quirky Luna is. I wouldn't say it was like a budding relationship or anything like that. Luna is just out there a little bit. Kyle, what are your thoughts about the Harry Potter relationships, especially the two main ones? 
I, you know, I think you kind of hit the nail on the head. Ron and Hermione seemed a lot more natural, but you know, I could have also seen Hermione and, and uh, Harry together too. I mean, I, I felt like it could have worked with either. I liked that it was a little bit more unconventional though. Like if we're kind of looking at it from a movie perspective, like Harry ended up with Ginny. They didn't really build it up. It kind of didn't almost make sense, but I, I don't know. It's just like, and some people like really got upset about that. And I, when I'm, um, you know, I remember back in the day, but I kind of liked that it was unconventional. Um, so I don't know, but I think, yeah, throughout the, throughout the movies and, and even some of the books, I, it's been a minute since I've read the books, but you definitely get some, you kind of get these teases on who Harry's going to be with, you know, from different, uh, you know, characters in the book. But I think Ginny was a, you know, a good choice at the end. Okay. I, I, I definitely trust your guys' judgment on that one. And were there many more relationships like that in the book? I know, Court, you told me Lupin and I, what's her name? Tonks. Tonks, yeah. Tonks, they end up together. Were there many other ones? Um, yeah, there were some, like, there There might have been some hint of Neville and Luna ending up together a little bit. There was, they don't end up marrying each other. Um, funny story, Luna Lovegood ends up marrying the grand um, son of the Fantastic Beast main guy, which is pretty cool. Oh, that's right. Um, yeah. Oh, I but, you know, it, there's a little hints. I mean, it's like junior high for these guys. They're trying to figure it out. And so I think for a lot of people, there's a lot of fan fiction out there, too, where um, Harry and Hermione are together because so many people do like that relationship. They have um, in the final book when they're out um, trying to kill Voldemort and Ron runs away, Harry and Hermione get super close. But to me, I always felt like it was a brother sister relationship and maybe that's just because i felt that more in the book than the movies not sure yeah it, it definitely seemed like that and maybe maybe it was just jk rowling's way of keeping us in suspense and keeping us guessing in a way i don't know i but it's definitely made it for an interesting read like i like when i don't really kind of know you know at least from a, like a relationship perspective i kind of like when i don't know who's gonna end up with who like it's I kind of like that. Yeah, I totally get that. Where it's when it seems obvious from the start, and you're right. It even I probably thought from the start Harry and Hermione would end up together when I saw the movie for the first time. But unconventional the way they went, and again, the movie wasn't about relationships anyway. Um, at least relationships like that. So speaking of some of my favorite relationships, um, is the one of my favorite relationships in the movies. And the story altogether is the one Hagrid has with our three main characters. Um, and Courtney was just telling me this week how Hagrid's intelligence is actually made out to be, he's made out to be a little bit more of an oaf in the movies and just big and clumsy and can't spell. But like I was being told, and to my understanding in the books, he's a little bit more sophisticated. Yeah, so, and this aggravates a lot of Harry Potter fans too. So in the very first movie, when Hagrid goes to tell Harry, you're a wizard, Harry, and he gives him a cake and happy birthday is misspelled in the movie and it's not in the books, it's spelled correctly. And I think they just lay on to the fact that he's a dumb oaf and he's really not because Hagrid was actually kicked out of school and his wand was taken away from him and destroyed when actually he kind of configured his umbrella into a wand on his own so he can use magic and you'll see him use it throughout the movies and the books so if he's smart enough to configure and take a wand and make it into his umbrella he's not as dumb as an oaf as it's made out to be um he's still lovable of course he's like a big brother to harry and very protective over him and he has a huge part in the movie in the books it just I don't know, part of me gets a little aggravated when they just make him like this big old dope when he's really not. Yeah, I didn't personally remember that. And wow. I you know, that's a good print comparison. And when I was reading the notes, I was like, that's that's gonna be an interesting discussion because I, I don't remember that. But um you know, I I get the big dopey oaf part of it because it just there's something maybe cute about it or adorable about it. And um it I don't know. I, you know, it's like you really feel that connection between those. You know, I would say this is that 
whatever the case is, it's like that connection between him and, and, and the three main characters is just amazing. I think they do a really good job in the movies of that. Oh, agreed, agreed. He's he's plays such an integral part into their growth and to, to how they build their relationships with each other and how they figure things out. And, you know, Haggard helps them along the way, depending on where they're at in the movies and books. So he's 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 definitely one of my favorite characters. Um, not my favorite, but one of my favorite in the whole movie. So speaking of badass characters, I'm going to segue. And Courtney actually told me this story, and I researched it. So Professor McGonagall, um, the actress played by Maggie Smith, um, is a certified badass. Okay, so she filmed... Um, the Half-Blood Prince while undergoing chemotherapy for breast cancer when she was 73, 70 fucking three years old, going through chemotherapy. I mean, chemo alone, no matter how old you are, and she's 73, so she's a little experienced. She's filming, probably filming scenes after each other, one after another, one after another, you know, if the take didn't work. And then in between scenes, I understand she'd just go sit down. So that's that's pretty incredible. Yeah, I... I can't say it as good as you did, but she's she's a rock star. I mean, she would literally film a scene. They would have a special chair off to the side for her. She'd film a scene, go sit down and rest, because I can't even imagine going through chemo and then having to not go through hair, makeup, and everything else that it involves to even set up the scene. But then you're having to act like a completely different person, not act tired. I mean, she's just a certified badass, that's for sure. She really is, and and I give her so much credit. I remember hearing this story when I went to see the film, and I was just in awe. And, and like to be able to do that is is unbelievable. And maybe it just kind of goes to show like her her passion and dedication to the film. And, and I give her all the respect for it. And this kind of goes along the same wavelength of actors and actresses that they used for these films, because I'm just astounded by the stories that I've heard. Like the Luna Lovegood actress, Ivana Lynch, uh, now an infamous uh, animal activist, was just a Harry Potter fangirl before casting of Luna Lovegood. And Courtney, I'm going to hand it over to you. I want you to tell us the story of the, the, the one you told me earlier this week about how all the characters fit perfectly in their roles and, and what they did. Yeah, and I think a big part of this is why the movies worked out so well. So the director of Prisoner of Azkaban, he gave um, the three main characters, so Emma Watson, Daniel Radcliffe, and um, Rupert Grant, he gave them all a, a homework assignment, and he wanted them to write a paper about their characters. And this is how perfectly they fit in. So Emma Watson wrote a 17-page single-lined paper about Hermione Granger, Um Rupert Grant completely forgot about it and didn't turn in anything. <laughs> That's awesome. Daniel Radcliffe, the night before, just wrote a one-page paper about it. I mean, how perfect. That's exactly who they are. It's so funny. And Luna Lovegood, like Tom was saying, she's just she was a fangirl this whole time. And she is Luna. Um, I mean, personality-wise, she's quirky, she's goofy, and she makes being weird just cool. I think that's what makes the movie so great and so realistic. And I heard that she's exactly the same way in real life, that she is on film. Did you hear that? Yeah, yeah, she totally is. I mean, the, these characters are them. I can't. And then um, the actress who plays Ginny, she didn't even want to try out. They had tryouts at the school. Her brother had actually read the books and said, hey, this Ginny character kind of reminds me of you. You should try out for it. And she's like, oh, really? Okay. And she just gave it a try. She had never really heard of Harry Potter. And she's not even really an actress and completely got the part because she is Ginny. <laughs> it's just, I don't know how they found these guys. And they were only hiring British actors and they all fit so well. And wasn't there a rumor that uh, J.K. Rowling wrote Snape for Alan Rickman? That's probably true. I haven't heard that rumor, but it, it would make a lot of sense. I mean, he is spot on. I mean, I can't, I couldn't even visualize a better Snape than Alan Rickman. Really yeah. Really it, Snape is my, is my favorite character out of Harry Potter. I mean, for obvious reasons, and I'm sure he is for most people. I'm sure I'm not breaking the internet by saying Snape's my favorite, but... Yeah. Um, I, 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 I die every single time at Prisoner of Azkaban when he's running up the stairs where um, Sirius Black and um, uh, Lupin. Lupin are up Press. there and 
he like stops <laughs> just laugh every time <laughs> oh my god he I know stops. It's to be funny wait why what part he like he stops and does what he he like like um snape runs up the stairs to to save harry and and everybody and he's like running up the stairs and like he gets to the top and he like stops and he does this like dramatic pause <laughs> and, and, and then he runs into the room you have to see it you have to see it it's okay next... I, I just i actually just watched it because i binge watched all the movies this week and okay. uh i know exactly what you meant i just didn't know exactly what part okay happened. okay yeah that part makes me die every single time i see it so right. um so let's have a little quick fun uh, the Pottermore House. So if you're a Harry Potter fan, you obviously know about Pottermore, which is now the Wizarding World, I believe it's called. Yeah. Um, so we all took the Pottermore test, if not recently or several years ago. So I'll go real quick and uh, first, and then I'll pass it along to you guys. So, so just a little fun. Which which house did the uh, Sorting Hat sort us all into in, in court? I'd like to get kind of hear you do a quick breakdown of what each house means. Because I'll get there. Hold on. After after we t- we we tell who we are, then then give a breakdown of of the houses. So um, I was sorted into Ravenclaw because I'm super smart and and a lot more quirkier than you guys. Um, and my Patronus is a stallion, and, and that means I'm cool. So yeah, end of podcast. Okay, bye. No, just kidding. Um, Kyle, what was your what was your uh, uh, house that the sorting hat put you into? And, and do you remember your Patronus? You know what? I don't remember my Patronus, but I'm going to say I can just I could say that my Patronus is a fat cat. So. (laughs) okay, that's fine. So it's Freddy sandwiches. My 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 Patronus is uh, is Freddy sandwiches. That makes sense. If that's uh, that makes sense. And uh, my house, my house was Gryffindor. But when I was reading about Ravenclaw, like I could really see being in Ravenclaw, too. But that's. Consistently, I've gotten Gryffindor when I've taken it three times. Okay. Um, so I was Slytherin. Um, yeah. Oh. And um, my Patronus was a cat. Not surprising. I guess that kind of fits with the Slytherin theme. So a breakdown of each house. So Gryffindor is really going to be like your protective type person. They're brave. They're the ones that if a fight breaks out, they're the ones that, you know, kind of stick by their side and defend their side. Um, Slytherin is ambitious. Um, they're the ones, you know, that are really fighting to get to the top. Um, they're, if you say you're a perfectionist, you're probably going to be Slytherin. Uh, Ravenclaw, intelligence, of course. Um, that one's probably one of the more common ones. Yeah. And then um, last but not least, just Hufflepuff. Everybody makes fun of Hufflepuff, but uh. I think we need more Hufflepuffs in the world. They're the ones that are mother-like. They're your nurses, your teachers. They're just caring and overall uh, counteract with the uh, Slytherins, that's for sure. Sounds like Tom. Tom, you seem mother-like. <laughs> you get Gryffindor. You're not brave. <laughs> I am brave. I'm like, I'm real man. You're not brave. You don't know fear. Okay. All right. Calm down. This is a Harry Potter podcast. It's not. Oh, Batman. Sorry. Sorry. All right. I'm shocked you weren't a Hufflepuff. I mean, Hufflepuff does have the best memes out of all of them. <laughs> you know what I would say this though is like, and, and maybe I don't think they really focus a lot on the houses. I mean, you heard about Slytherin and, and, and Gryffindor, but you really don't get a lot about Ravenclaw or Hufflepuff. I mean, you really don't. I don't know if, like, I'm just missing, like, I just, like, you know, missed that part of the books, but. So what's interesting, too, is, and I think they maybe go into it a little bit more in the books, because they always make the argument that why isn't Hermione a Ravenclaw? She's the brightest witch of her age. And Dumbledore makes a point to explain that it's not necessarily the abilities you have, it's the abilities that you admire. So for Hermione, she always felt like being smart came natural to her. Anybody can pick up a book and read it and regurgitate the information, but to be brave and courageous is, was more important trait to her than being intelligent. Wow. That's awesome. That's really interesting. And it's all about choices too, right? Just like the quote that I'm putting at the beginning of our podcast that Dumbledore tells to Harry, it's, and I think Harry was questioning the Sorting Hat, 
And he was scared he was going to go to Slytherin, right? So, and Gryffindor kind of reminded him, it's the choices you make. That's why you ended up where you ended up. So, that's cool. I, I, that's, that's one of the part about Harry Potter lore that I absolutely love is the sorting hat and getting places in the houses. I, I think it's cool to break down and see where people lay up and, and where they land. Back when I worked as a personal trainer, I, I made all the trainers take the Pottermore test and, and we put it up on the board. Um, Matt Hoodie was a Hufflepuff. I just want to put that out there. So, huh. Just in case he ever listens to this. Um, but moving along, um, so speaking of, so some more, you know, extended Harry Potter universes, let's have a brief Fantastic Beasts discussion. So what, why, why do these movies get hate? Um, you know, and I'll just real quick for um, Fantastic Beasts, I enjoy the movies when I, when we go see them for a casual Harry Potter world fan. Um, you know, I dig the flicks. I saw a real no big issue with either one of them, but, but then again, I didn't have merit to stand on from being like a fanboy. Uh, were they a little bit tad slow? Maybe. Um, but they're rewatchable to me, and revisiting Hogwarts and the sequel was really cool and got my member berries going. So, Courtney, I'll start with you. With what your thoughts on Fantastic Beasts? Because I kind of know where Kyle's going to go with this. Yeah, I mean, Fantastic Beasts, I was really excited for just ongoing movies in the Harry Potter universe. And um, me being a Harry Potter fan, huge fan, I, I don't hate them. Was Did anybody really ask for this? No. I mean, what I would love to see is back in the days when Harry's dad and Snape were in school with Lily. Like, that's what I want to see. I want to see, you know, Hogwarts and... Fantastic Beasts again. I I watched them. I own the movies. Am I going to get a tattoo of Fantastic Beasts? Absolutely not. I I would agree. I think there's this is such a rich world, and and we were talking about you know the, um, the Sorting Hat and the houses. Like you know, after the seventh book, they really didn't. You, there was a lot of questions left unanswered. There's a lot more in this world that J.K. Rowling created that really we don't still know about. And I think that's a great thing. And why they went with Fantastic Beasts, I would agree. I was so excited to see that. But, man, I watched that movie twice, and I feel like I couldn't tell you what it was about. Like, I really couldn't. And I've seen both of them. And when they come out with the third one, I'm going to see that one, too. But it's just out of, you know, passion for Harry Potter Again, there are so many stories that they could write that that really would just write themselves. And I don't know why they, they're not using that. I mean, they could write a, a whole like TV series, a movie series about like Sirius or like the Order of the Phoenix that I was talking about. Stuff that happened when James and Lily were in school. I mean, there's it's the possibilities are endless. Or they could write something completely new. I mean, really, they could write a mo- um, a series about Voldemort. You know, there's a rich uh, history there. Well, I'll I'll jump a topic um, and talk about what you know. You you made sense of that rumor earlier, Kyle, about that HBO Max series that might be coming out for uh, in the Harry Potter world. I mean, it's look, it's inevitable, especially that HBO Max, one of the properties that Warner Brothers, uh, you know, has and Warner Media has, which will not be Discovery, is Harry Potter, and they've got to capitalize on that. I mean, shit, it's Me, their biggest gun. It's their biggest it, gun. It is. It really is. And I'd love to see, and, and I'm saying this from what I said earlier, is I want to see the HBO Max series chronicle the life of a young Tom Riddle. I, I, I love the villain origin stories. I, um, give me him when he's a kid. Show me how he becomes basically abandoned. Uh, you know, that builds the character. Again, to your point, Kyle, they did a really good job in the books and the movies of building up the tension of who Voldemort was and you know how scary he really is but now that we know all that I'm very much interested in his past and why he is the way he is so court if I remember correctly you wanted the James and Lily Potter um, story so expand on that yeah I want to see the tension between Snape and James I want to see James acting like a dick in front of Snape and showing off and Lily getting embarrassed because they didn't like each other. I want to know more about that or even go further back and go back to like the founding fathers and of actual Hogwarts. Let's learn more about them. That would be cool too. I mean, like you said, Kyle, there's so many different options and nobody asked for Fantastic Beasts. I'm not trying to hate on it, but there's so many other avenues they could have gone down that would have made fans really excited. 
Fantastic Beasts doesn't seem like Harry Potter to me. I don't know why, but when I watch it, I'm like, don't play the Harry Potter music because this doesn't feel like that world. I don't know. It really just doesn't to me. I could see that argument. I really could. And I always want to watch Fantastic Beasts again. I just never get around to it just to like try to get into it for more of, especially as I'm getting more and more into Harry Potter and when I eventually read the books, I'm sure I'll, I'll be aligned with you guys and just be kind of like, eh, nobody asked for this. So, but again, I'll see the third movie. I'll be in the theaters just with you guys. Um, so we'll see it. So, um, with the world of Harry Potter, you know, out there in the universe that it's created, much like Galaxy's Edge exists, the Wizarding World at Universal Studios Orlando. And I'm telling you, this is an absolute must do for the tiniest Harry Potter fan. When I went with Courtney, it was so much better because I had a little more vested interest in the property. And aside from the potential, potential motion sickness that the Hogwarts attraction itself gives you, that's the crowning achievement of the Wizarding World. So depending on what side you go in, you can go in through Diagon Alley or you can go in through the Hogsmeade section. But let's just walk through the Hogsmeade section, and it's there, and there's there's snow on the roof. It, it feels like you're walking. It, this is, is this London or is Diagon Alley in London? Yeah, Diagon Alley is London. Okay, so Hogsmeade is where Hogwarts is at. Yeah, yeah okay. All right, sorry. Um, so you're walking. You can see Hogwarts in the background. That's right. Yeah, you can see Hogwarts in the background. You could buy a, a wand from Ollivander's. You can get butter beer. Um, you can go to now the Weasley's trick shops in Diagon Alley, mm -hmm. right? So um, I, there's candy stores. It's it's basically it's ripped right out. And I remember when you and I were watching the first movie, Court. It's ripped right out of you know the movie, like the pages of the book. Uh, how did you feel the first time we kind of stepped place in the Hogsmeade? I mean, I got goosebumps, so I was holding back tears. I mean, you're walking through and you hear the music, and it really feels like you're on set. And Harry Potter has just been a big part of my life. I think I've read the books, each one probably six or seven times. So, I mean, growing up on it and the books being released as I grow up, it just... It brings back memories from my childhood, getting excited when new books would come out and then the movie series. So it was almost intense. I remember you kept asking me like, are you okay? Cause I was just silent. I yeah. was like soaking it all in. I think I was just holding back tears because it was like, it was that emotional for me, which sounds a little intense, but it's like, I've waited <laughs> two decades for this. <laughs> so it was, it was awesome. I would live there if I could. Well, we kind of are. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, I think the first time I was there was when I went to your wedding. And when I walked in there, firstly, I, the, my favorite thing about it is that they don't tell you where it is. You have to find it. And right. at least you go into the Universal Studios side. And it's like, it looks like you're walking into a bathroom. And, and then you kind of like turn a corner and then you're just in this like, you know, on the street with all this Harry Potter stuff. And it's, it is absolutely brilliant. I mean, the, the engineering and the architecture and just the ambiance is, is dead on perfect. And I'm like, Courtney, I, I felt emotional just being in the rides and seeing, you know, um, my favorite, one of some of my favorite movies come to life. And the fact that the other really cool thing about when I was there the last time is the interactive wands where you can, Right. You get a wand and like it, you like point it at different things in the area and it comes to life. And it just, it, it really is brilliant. It really is. And um, I, I've heard that they actually have like this, they have other things like in London, they have this whole thing where you can actually go there and you see props from the set. And it's like this whole experience. Damn. So if I ever go to Europe, I feel like, and maybe this is just like the, I don't want to say trash in me, but like, you know, people go to Europe to see like really cultural things. I would go to Europe to go to like Paris, Disney and see the Harry Potter experience in, in London. So. Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, All right. Yeah. Yeah. And you're the, the entrance you were talking about was the entrance through Diagon Alley. So you're in London, the yeah. streets of London, and you walk right, right. in through Diagon Alley. Uh, real quick, I, I want to get off topic real quick, but did you see the, speaking of interactive shit that theme parks are releasing, did you see the Spider-Man web slinger that's announced for Avengers Campus? 
No. All right, I want you to look into that. You're gonna you're gonna like it a lot. It's it's a web slinger that you have to purchase it. But if people bitch about this, then bitch about having to purchase a, a wand at Universal Studios. Okay, just make up your fucking mind, Diz Twitter. But um, this interactive web slinger, you wear it and you could take it, and it works on the sp- the brand new Spider Man ride that's going to be at Avengers Campus. So, so you you like can web stuff on the ride. It's what it sounds like. Yeah. Is, does it actually shoot webbing, or is it like a just a Kind of like you know the interactive wand. I think it's I think it's like the interactive wand. I haven't looked in it terribly too much, but that's just on the surface what I've heard. But check it out. Wow, that's cool. So in the Wizarding World, just just to wrap up on how awesome Universal does with that. Um, there's the Hagrid's motorboat m- motorboat. <laughs> <laughs> Holy crap! We've been talking a while. Hagrid's motorbike coaster, which is incredible. Um, no, want- no 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 motorboat going on. <laughs> On the ride, I promise. <laughs> there is, but that's that's another podcast topic, people. We're talking about Harry Potter. Okay? I think you are, I think you want a motorboat Hagrid. <laughs> yeah, I'll do that to Hagrid. I don't care anymore. <laughs> oh boy. All right. Go back uh, to, okay, so you were talking about motorboating Hagrid. Yes, uh, you motorboat Hagrid on the ride, specifically next to all the Fantastic Beasts and the. The big scorpion that doesn't move and all that shit. Um, you can drink pumpkin juice while you're doing it. Butterbeer, the trolley cart candy favorites, and Weasley's Magic Shop in uh, Diagon Alley. Um, and there's Escape from Gringotts. It's it's an excellent ride. Uh, the queue is actually better than the ride, in my opinion, um, because it's an awesome queue inside of Gringotts Bank. It looks like it's ripped right from the movie. Like, literally, it's so cool with all the animatronics. Are those elves? Goblins, duh. Uh, I'm an idiot. Uh, but anyway, uh, moving it along, let's talk. Uh, last topic we'll talk about, and we'll, before we talk next topics, is we'll just end it with our favorite movie. Um, and I will let you know, you guys go first and talk about your favorite movie since Harry Potter's your thing. So, uh, ladies first, Kyle. Uh, okay. Um, well, let me say is that we should call this podcast episode Harry Potter slash motorboating Hagrid <laughs> <laughs> episode title the time I motorboated Hagrid <laughs> there you go I- perfect perfect um, okay so my favorite movie I think it's really hard um, because they're all so really well done and I think I would probably say the seventh the Deathly Hollows, just because it is so vastly it's such a, a divergent it's it's so different than the rest of the series in in that they're not at Hogwarts. They're kind of out, you know, looking for Horcruxes. They're in the world, and it just it's so different and you know raw and real and just amazing, absolutely amazing. I love it. Yeah, that one is my. I think it's ranking in at number two, especially part two of the Deathly Hallows. But my favorite movie runs the uh, Goblet of Fire. Um, it just sticks out to me the introduction and the entrance of Voldemort makes just epic. Um, it's a long time coming in the from the buildup of the previous movies, and I think the full reveal to Harry and the way it went down and how it goes down is just perfect. And he's super, just st- you know, strategic about it. He's super slitherin like about it. He's super just evil the way he reveals himself, um, and it's just perfect. Plus. You know how I love consequences in movies. Uh, there's a consequence in that movie where the tragic death death of Cedric Diggory. And it really changes Harry. And Courtney, you know, clued me on to this. It just changes Harry. He gets a little bit darker. He gets a little a little emo, you would say, uh, after losing Cedric. Because he, he's, he's seen a lot of motherfucking people die. And the dude's like 14 at this point. <laughs> so <laughs> Goblet of Fire sticks out as my favorite movie for those reasons. So last but certainly not least, I'll let you close out the Harry Potter portion of today. Courtney, what is your favorite Harry Potter movie and book, if they're different? I'd like to know. Um, They're actually going to be the same. Prisoner of Azkaban is my favorite. Um, I feel like this is when Harry and team are really gaining their powers. They're getting a more understanding of 
Voldemort. And I mean, the first two movies are fun and all, but the third one really sticks out to me. They introduce Sirius Black. There's a great twist in this movie. They have to go back in time. Buckbeak, of course, is in there. Um, Harry's Patronus comes out. You learn a little bit more about that. Um, This one to me is just always stuck out as being my favorite overall. But I will say I love them all, so it was pretty difficult for me to choose. But Deathly Hallows I really like, too, because, like you were saying, Kyle, you know, they're not at Hogwarts anymore. They're out in the real life and kicking ass. I, I would say that uh, Prisoner of Azkaban, when he does the Patronus at the end, that, that is an amazing, amazing scene. I love that scene. That's my, one of my favorite scenes. It is. It's incredibly meaningful, and you, you totally get why he... You know why he does it, and the way he—it's the first time he conjures it, right? Yeah, it's it's such a meaningful, meaningful, and impactful moment. So that was Harry Potter, everybody. That was fun. Thanks so much, babe, for joining us. Because because again, uh, you know a lot more about this than I do. And Kyle, awesome talking Harry Potter. Uh, hey, next week let's talk the Nolan trilogy. Does that sound good? Fuck yeah! All right, something that we both love. And I'd really like to break down that trilogy because a lot of people think, think it's untouchable and to a point they do, but there are some things that could have been done better and especially with iterations of Batman we've seen since. But that's getting into it, but we're going to have some fun with that. And then uh, the week after that, we'll talk all things Marvel. So calm down, Marvel fanboys. We're going to get there. Uh, thank you for listening. Um, Kyle, do you, do you have any more wisdom to impart on the world before we leave everybody today? Well, let me say this, is that when we talk about Marvel, I promise not to shit on it. I promise. And <laughs> what I'll leave, what final word that I'll say on this is I want everybody to remember, take this to your grave. Remember that Dobby is a free elf. That's right. Dobby's a free elf. Never forget that. Never forget. Well, thank you for everybody who's joined us and gone along the journey to the Wizarding World. Follow us on Instagram at 4th Motherbox. And on Facebook, the Fourth Mother Box Podcast. And if you've lasted this long, you're the best. Let's be friends. If you cut out early on us, I don't like you. But if you didn't listen to us at all, you're not listening to this, so you can go to hell. Everybody, we'll see you next week.